said that they didn't know they had to put their name in the chat. <laughs> I was like, oh, you mean what we announced at the beginning of every single meeting <laughs> numerous times? <laughs> Maybe they're always late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was laughing. All right, so we're live on uh, the YouTube as well, so. Mm. Okay. So Libby, we, we tend to start at like 12.32. The kids get out of class at 12.30. Sure, yeah. yeah. We're getting up there in numbers. And I presume you have some announcements after the seminar as usual. Um, hold on, I'm looking at my, my notes. I want to say we could let them go, but I, I'm worried if we let them go today, they'll go tomorrow. Think, just give a quick check yeah. the dashboard. Because I don't think we have a seminar tomorrow. Oh, no, we don't. No. So just keep an eye on the dashboard. Keep an, and remind, there's no seminar tomorrow. Right. We can, in fact, you can message everybody in the chat, too, so that way. Yep. Joel, did we get rid of, wasn't there a mid-program survey? That, uh, we ended up getting rid of that. I don't know why either. Okay. I, I think the mid-program survey was important, but it seemed like when uh, we give them the, the end of the first week to do the initial survey, and then you have the mid one, there was too much overlap, so. Yeah, you're right. Not much growth by the time they finished it. Yeah. Like the, getting the postcard email out earlier last year, this year, next year will be important yeah. too. So. Uh -uh. Okay, yep, yeah, there is none until the 25th. Right, Monday. Okay, is that Monday? I don't even know what today is. We can give a plug for uh, um, rate that on Monday. Yep. Is Dom, uh, is Dom Larkin the speaker? You tell me. I, all right, I am going to tell you one second. No, Dom Larkin is not the speaker. So email, um, did you email me the abstract? Because I'll pull it from there. Um, Bob emailed it to us this morning. OK. All right, I'll update that then. Okay. Dom Larkin is, is the speaker for the class. Okay, I'll start admitting. Hey y'all, remember to sign in. Put your name in the chat, please. All right, hi everyone. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, I hope everyone's having a, a fantastic day. I just wanna remind you all to uh, please sign in with your name in the chat um, before we get going. And um, let's see, um, looks like the numbers are still climbing up a little bit, but we can, um, but slowly, so we can probably get started. Um, I'm really pleased today to, uh, to, to introduce uh, the speaker, Livia Rax, uh, who is the leader of the Advanced Materials and Microsystems Group at uh, Lincoln Laboratory. Um, the group is really focused on developing new materials and processes for multi-material uh, systems, as well as 
uh, sensing and communications applications in unusual form factors, some of which you're going to hear about today uh, for national security applications. Um, some of the highlights from Livia's group include um, advanced materials for hypersonic flight, um, satellites, which are on the scale of silicon wafers and it, uh, integrated as well as microelectronics embedded in textile fibers, which is, I believe, the topic of, of today's talk. So Livia joined um, Lincoln Laboratory in 2015 uh, after over eight years at Draper Laboratory. So I think she's worked about as long at, at Lincoln now as, as at Draper, which is fantastic. Um, uh, at Draper, she led the Microsystems Technology Division. She also worked in um, a couple of early stage startups and academia focus on, um, on miniature electronic uh, systems. So um, Livia, uh, we're really thrilled to have you here today. I think the way that we're gonna do uh, questions today, uh, let me just remind you all, if you have a question, please put your question in the chat, but we're going to take them as the talk goes. Uh, although we might give Livia a few minutes to, to, to get started and uh, get everyone introduced to what she's talking about today. So uh, Livia, why don't you take it away? And uh, we're really thrilled to have you here today. All right, well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, I have two screens, so I apologize if occasionally it looks like I'm staring into space. I'll do my best not to do that. Um, can you see the presentation version of my talk? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you everybody for tuning in. I'm really thrilled to present this topic to you. So um, the title of my talk is Advanced Technologies for Sensing and Communication in Threads. advance my slide. Here we go. So when we think of a sensor, what do we think of? Maybe you might think of something like this on your wall. Or maybe if you're making circuit boards, maybe you think of something that looks like this, you know, big clunky thing, you put it on a circuit board, it goes into a bigger system. Or maybe a wearable sensor. I bet a lot of you have Fitbits or Apple Watches. And maybe not as many of you, but maybe some of you have something that starts to look like normal clothing. But I bet not a whole lot of us think of a sensor looking like this, you know, just a plain old white t-shirt, no unusual features, just a shirt. Well, in this case, we're starting to get close to being able to do this, where the thread itself is the sensor or the communication system or the computer. Okay, so that's actually a little microsystem, a little electronic microsystem going through the eye of a needle. So that's pretty cool. How do we do that? And how did we even, how did we even get that idea? So this whole field started, you know, 15, 16 years ago um, with a professor at MIT. Perhaps some of you have met him, uh, Yoel Fink. And he had an interesting insight. You know, looking at the cross section of a thread, you'll see a few of these monofilament fibers. And if you do a cross section of one of these in a microscope, it looks about like this. It's a single material. It has simple architecture. It doesn't really do much. What does it do? I mean, it keeps you warm, keeps you covered. Um, it maybe has interesting colors or patterns. That's about it. But, you know, look at that cross section and look at that length into the page. You could fit multiple materials in there. What if you had a way to put metals, semiconductors, and insulators in there? Well, those are the three materials you need to make an electronic device. So if you could do that, you could come up with some device architecture and you could have electronic functionality. You could have sensing functionality, maybe communication functionality, maybe some other things. So this here on the left, of course, is the mainstay of the traditional textile industry, which is largely gone from the United States. Sadly, when we buy clothes, they're often made in Southeast Asia. Sometimes they're made in other places. They're very seldom made in the US unless you try hard specifically to buy them here or buy, buy clothes that are made here. Whereas this thing on the right has the potential for completely new capabilities for nucleating completely new industries, if you think about it if we get good at it. So how do we get good at it? So here's a, here's a picture in a video of the early days of, of how, how we started to do this. Um, we start out with a macroscopic object. 
that has all the features in it and all the materials in it that we want the final fiber or thread to have. And you see on the left, this tall tower, this is Dave D'Amelio here. He's going up this tower. And you see this glowing thing over here. That's actually the preform. That's what you see over here. And eventually it, um, you know, it gets pulled, it gets heated and pulled. And if you do things right, then all the material that started out in the preform gets pulled. You can barely see the fiber. Okay, now you can't see it because he's going up the tower, but you can see the glowing furnace here. You can see part of the preform and it gets pulled into a fiber that might be you know, hundreds of microns thick and have nanometer scale features that are preserved in the same shape and aspect ratio as they were up here on the centimeter scale. So that's pretty cool. You know, you start with something a few feet long and you, excuse me for the unit, uh, the unit mixing, but you might end up with something that is multiple kilometers in length. And so this is the same way that optical fibers are made if, if you happen to know how that works. So that's, a, that's pretty interesting and enabling, but there are a number of disadvantages, okay? Well, I guess before I get into the disadvantages, maybe I'll talk about what you can do um, with this process. You might make that preform have alternating layers of material in such a way that when you pull it down small, they are um, certain, certain fractions of wavelengths apart. So that might give you structural color like a butterfly wing. So here's an example of the same set of materials with different spacing give you different colors. Okay, what, what could you do with that? You could do some interesting things with that. Okay, this talk is about sensors. So you can make some simple fiber-based sensors with that process. Um, you can detect chemicals, you can detect some other attributes. They don't tend to be very sensitive. So they're okay sensors. They're, they're good for writing papers on, but maybe not so good for operations. Um, you can emit light, right? Which means you can communicate optically. So that's pretty interesting. You have to stay at fairly low power though, because these materials melt at fairly low temperatures. So you can communicate short distances. That's pretty interesting. You can also actively change color. So if any of you have Kindles and are, and are uh, familiar with uh, electrophoresis, electrophoretic um, particles, which is how your Kindle works, you can put those in a fiber and have active color change. You can weave those into, into clothing. You can weave them into bags or shoes or whatever and, and have active color change. So you can, you can do a fair amount with this, uh, with this process. So now that I've told you what you can do. Olivia? Yes? I'm gonna pause here. There are, there are a bunch of questions. Okay, uh, some good. of these might be things that you're planning on addressing later, but I figured okay. I'd just pause so that uh, some folks can, can, can ask some of them. Uh, let's start with um, Evan, Evan Quo, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, um, I was just curious. So if this, uh, if clothing was created with this type of thread, mm -hmm. how durable would this thread be and how expensive would the article of clothing be in comparison to something more traditional? Sure, um, I mean, the answer to both of those is it depends. So we, um, I'll talk more about some of the applications where we had to worry about durability a lot. So um, a lot of the things we do aren't actually wearable. Um, but you know, one example, which I'll talk about later, we, we had to put it in the ocean. So we did a lot of durability testing for being able to uh, withstand that salt water environment. Um, but for clothing, you, know, you probably want to machine wash it. We haven't done a lot of that. Um, I'll, I'll get into a little bit later um, how that is actually going to happen soon. Um, so, you know, so you'll be able, be able to answer that question of how durable is it? And, um, you know, you're gonna have to encapsulate these. If, if you wanna wash them and if you want to um, have them be durable, then you have to put a coating on them that enables them to be durable under the right environmental circumstances. So we have processes to do that. Um, again, so far we haven't had a lot of reason to, um, to make durable clothing because most of the work we do at Lincoln is, is not for wearable applications. As for the cost, um, fundamentally the process is very inexpensive because you, you can take, you know, you, you can take a chunk of material that's cheap to make, cheap to put together, this preform, and you can make a lot of it quickly. 
you know, you pull a fiber, just like optical fibers ended up being really cheap. Um, so fundamentally, it's, it's going to be an inexpensive process. Of course, we would have to take that from our prototyping environment into some corporate environment where they work out all the bugs and they work out a, a you know, rapid manufacturing process. But it's, it's actually very promising as, a, as an inexpensive large scale process. Thank you very much. Sure. All right, and maybe maybe we'll just take uh, one more. I think you actually hit your your answer hit on answers to a lot of the folks' questions. But um, let's see, Dotri Parakal, you you had uh, uh, another question that you want to ask. Um, hi, yeah. So you kind of answered uh, one part of my question, which is basically like what happens if you like sweat or like get water on the shirt. Mm -hmm. But um, I had another question. How would you like? charge this shirt or like what source of energy would fuel the shirt in general? Yeah, so I'll talk about that later too. But um, that is a that is the big elephant in the room right now is batteries. So, um, you know, microelectronics, uh, electronic components are pretty small, although generally not quite small enough for these applications still. Batteries are not small enough. And they and so so very often there's there's still kind of a rigid puck stump stuck someplace. Um, we are actively working on fiber-based batteries. Other people are working on flexible batteries. Lots of people are working on this problem. Um, and conversely, lots of people are working, in, including us, on, on uh, sub-threshold electronics that would power some of these things. So you sort of attack the problem from, from two sides. You try to get it to be as low power as possible. And then on the flip side, you work on advanced battery technology. Um, Supercapacitors already exist that are fiber-based, so those work well for certain applications. Um, and there are also applications where you don't have to store, you can just scavenge energy. And solar fibers, actually the University of Maine has a really nice solar fiber that, um, you know, that can be incorporated for applications where you don't have to store energy. So it's in progress. Thank you, that answered my question. Great. Okay, so I was just about to get into some of the disadvantages of this particular process where we just take all the materials up front, put it in the, uh, you know, put it in the preform and pull it. Well, one is, of course, as you probably already figured out, you know, if you put a lot of materials in this and they have dissimilar properties, they have to elongate, they have to soften and elongate at the same rate in order for this to work. So that will severely curtail your options as to what materials you can put in here. Um, well, okay, so you can do a different thing. You can say, all right, I can either melt everything at the same rate, or I wanna feed some materials in there that never melt. So for example, I wanna feed some conductors in there. They're gonna be my conductive chassis. They're not gonna melt. Okay, so you can do that. That's another thing you can do. Um, yet another thing you can do, if you can't find the materials that you need for your sensor to be sort of continuous along the length of this fiber, you can preload chips into the preform. Maybe they're your sensor chips. And so, you know, you might imagine you, you, you put them, you put a bunch of chips right next to each other, very, very, very close together. And then when you pull on it, they end up getting farther apart. They end up um, the, uh, contacting the conductors and then they end up working and that's, that's cool. But now they're a constrained distance apart because you can only put them as close together as they physically, you know, you can physically make them touch. You can't put them any closer together than that. So what if you need them closer together than that, than, than, you know, than the elongation ratio? You can't, right? So these are the things you can do with this process. And, and yes, it's fairly powerful, but it's also, it's also limiting. So then we had a very important insight. At least I think it was an important insight. If you stop thinking about this fiber as a thread and as a wearable, and you think about it as a completely novel microelectronics packaging platform, you know, think about this as a circuit board. Well, there's a lot of equipment out there and a lot of know-how out there for populating circuit boards. What if we can use that on these threads? Well, then you, you've just opened up the process space and the potential product space for, the, for this platform. So we actually developed this the so-called advanced system and fiber technology platform, where we go and we place 
individual chips down. We do draw the wire chassis. We do the, draw the connectors um, in uh, thermally. But then we, we place our components, but we also had to develop an application specific integrated circuit that enables us to communicate individually with each of the components, because that's what you would do on a circuit board or on a wafer. And once we did that, um, we started thinking about all kinds of other things that we could do. I'm not going to read these. You can you can read these yourself and you know show show you kind of where we are. We have certain technical goals, some of which we've accomplished and some of which we're still working on. And then we have certain manufacturing goals, most of which we're still working on because we don't really manufacture here at Lincoln. So we have partners who do that. And kind of one of the big sort of pie in the sky things is the ability to cut and sew the wiring. Um, after you've pulled a bunch of thread. And so that still remains elusive. We have some ideas, maybe you guys have some ideas for that, but that's, that's still something that, that, that's in the future that we don't know how to do yet. Um, so how does the thread become a circuit board? Well, I sort of said this a little bit, but here's a cartoon representation. We draw the wire, this is the furnace, this is a preform. So this, this red thing represents the furnace up in that tower that you saw the video of. We draw in the wires, and we draw the fiber, okay? So now it's just kind of a dumb fiber with some wires in it. We've done up to 10, um, you know, typically we do four to six. And then we take a laser or sometimes just a CNC machine head and we locally remove the cladding to expose our wires. We pick and place the chips down using standard microelectronics assembly equipment. And then we either locally encapsulate and cure or we might overcoat the entire fiber, depending on the application, depending on what we're trying to do. And so this has a lot of advantages over the version where we have to put everything in at, at the start, because we can place any chip anywhere along the fiber. We can embed larger components and subsystems. And unfortunately, with most of the components being uh, manufactured for circuit boards or smartphones or smartwatches, they are often too large. They're often larger than we want but it does allow us to embed more complex functionality. Um, there's another thing, you know, circuit board analogy. You can sort of let your imagination run away with you with, with the circuit board analogy. And you can use one of these amazing machines. This is actually an industrial embroidery machine and it's about 12 feet long. It's really amazing. It's got a bunch of different heads and it can embroider, you can program all sorts of patterns and numbers of lines and shapes and sizes, and you can embroider sort of fuzzy raised things, and you can do all kinds of things with this tool. But one thing you can do is you can take your conductors or your optical waveguide, or even one of those multifunctional fibers that we drew on the draw tower and put them down in any, in any pattern. Okay. And we actually like serpentine patterns because that allows the fabric to have stretch. Okay, the fibers, especially if they have copper in them, are not going to stretch. You know, you try to pull on them, they're eventually going to break. Um, but if you put them down in a serpentine, now you have stretch. Now you've enabled yourself to have stretch. Okay, so you put down your maybe your conductive chassis, maybe some some something with more complex functionality, and you can pick and place discrete chips anywhere you want laminate down another layer, do it again. Well, that's getting to look an awful lot like a circuit board, except in a textile, right? So again, you know, all sorts of possibilities with some of these amazing tools. Well, okay, maybe you don't pick and place just chips down. Maybe you make little tiny interposers that carry multiple chips. So now you can have more complex interconnect. Um, and we can embed these complex little interposers. Okay, so here's an example of one. And you see, this is starting to get a little fat per thread. So this is now 2.1 millimeters by 4.6 millimeters. It hangs out of the fiber. Um, the fiber itself is, you know, it's more like lawn chair webbing at this point. But um, if you, as you'll see a little bit later for some of the applications, this is still way, way, way smaller than what's being done today. And therefore it's a, it's a key enabler. But wouldn't we love it if these components were a lot smaller? By the way, this red arrow pointing at this little custom chip, that's the thing that enables individual communication to all the nodes. So it takes care of all the timing, it takes care of all the communications back and forth. And then eventually for the people who asked about durability, um, oh, and this is the same chip right here. So this is the size of the chip compared to Penny, that's that guy. 
and then we encapsulate the whole thing. So here is this whole interposer encapsulated and rolled up. They each have an LED on them just so we can easily see whether or not they're working. So here's a hundred meter roll of this stuff. You can you can see it kind of kind of our our photographer took this cool image with the dark background that he liked, but it's the same. It's all the same chip. So what can we do with this capability today? So, and uh, again, this is a sensing talk, so we can do lots of sensing. We can do sensing under, under the ocean. We can do sensing from space. Imagine just a long skinny tail on a satellite that detects motion from space. We can geolocate in a GPS denied environment. We can take audio, we can take video. Okay, I promise that this is to scale. This is a normal sized pencil with about a millimeter tip and that's a, that's a two scale drawing. Um, we can communicate optically from some standoff distance. So this is a, this is a cartoon with some, um, you know, this is a, an army application where, um, where the soldiers are wearing a patch that can be communicated to remotely. Um, here's a cartoon, or it's not a cartoon, it's a picture that suggests a tablecloth in a hotel room that, that has some intelligence to it, that maybe stops people from stealing your password in an open Wi-Fi environment. This over here, same technology, it's a miniature cryocooler. Um, so there are novel technologies afoot using superconducting electronics that vastly lower the power for every computational um, operation. But you have to have a cooling infrastructure for that. So right now it's not really worth doing. It's not better than the computation we use today. But what if we could shrink that cooling infrastructure, which would be really amazing. That would be an amazing capability. We can detect chemicals. You know, we can put that chemical detection in people's clothing who are in harm's way, who might be exposed to those chemicals. Um, over here, we can detect when somebody is hypoxic. You know, people get pretty nervous jumping out of planes for the first time. And um, maybe their squad leader wants to know if they're gonna get sick or if they're gonna, maybe, maybe they shouldn't go on that jump because they're not doing that well. Um, we can make antennas that wrap around oddly shaped objects. Um, and in a completely different set of applications, we can leverage some of the same processes to make glass fibers that can amplify light for high energy applications. So this is just, these are all things we're actively doing, as well as the boxes that I didn't mention. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that we're actively doing. Again, many of these are not wearable. Some of them are wearable. Lots of lots and lots of things you can do. And since I don't really have time to go into detail, obviously, about all of these, I'm going to pick one to go into a little bit further detail on, and I'm going to pick this undersea sensing application. L Livia, before before you go into detail into one of the applications, there, there are a couple of questions. So okay. um, uh, one has to do with applications. One, one just has to do with the process. Maybe I'll start with the application question first. Uh, Riva, uh, uh, Amrit Kar, uh, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, so I had two actually. So first off, I was wondering if anyone was working on any like piezoelectric applications for like potentially charging these fabrics. And then also like, um, I know you mentioned the hypoxia detection, but are there any other like physiological applications that anyone's working on? Yes. So yes to both of those. Um, people are working on piezoelectric fibers for a couple different applications, actually. Um, one interesting application is, um, is that piezoelectric materials uh, can be used as microphones. So I did mention microphones. We have a different, a different way of doing that, but there, there are people in academia who are developing piezoelectric fibers to do exactly that. Um, it's still, they still have some challenges, particularly if you weave them into clothing, because when they, they rub against each other, they actually make noise and they pick up that noise and you don't really want to pick up that noise. So, so there's, that's, that's a little bit, little bit of a challenge that people are still working on. And um, people are also interested in, in piezoelectric fibers for actuation. For, um, for basically for adjusting structures in space. So there is a professor at MIT, Zach Cordero, who's interested in, in that and working on that. And he's generally interested in, in manufacturing lightweight structures in space. So this is sort of falls, falls into that, that application category. 
And then um, remind me again what your second question was. Uh, just like any other physiological applications, I know you mentioned the hypoxia detection, but other than that. Yeah, um, I mean, this is a great technology for all kinds of physiological monitoring applications. We don't have a lot of activity in that area only because they, people who are interested in those applications tend not to have a lot of research funding. So that's really the only reason, but, but this technology is actually great for, you know, for all kinds of things that you might, might wanna measure uh, physiologically. So like basically anything your, your smartwatch measures, you could, you could measure using, using a piece of fiber and, and many other things. All right, and uh, thanks. And there was one other question, uh, Kai Song, do you wanna uh, ask your question now? Uh, yes, um, can you hear me? Yep. All right, uh, first of all, I'd like to say like wonderful presentation and it's really an interesting topic. Um, so one of the things I was interested in is I know a lot about like 3D printers and how when they make the filament, like the plastic filament for those, um, like they aren't super accurate or anything. So I was just curious how um, your threading process, like when you make the micro, the micro threads, how you get them so accurate at such a micro level. Yeah, that's a great question. So the 3D printers, um, that print polymers like the desktop 3D printers. Um, that's a you know often like a it's like a like toothpaste you know you're extruding the material and it solidifies as it comes out. Uh, there are fiber uh, there are tools to make fibers that way too uh, called melt spinners, and you can get them very very accurate. I mean it's it, it's just a it's just a matter of precision engineering. Honestly, so the, the 3D printers that you know you might be familiar with that, that don't make very accurate filaments, it's just because they're not that precisely engineered, they're not that expensive. I mean, you can you can have a process like that that makes super accurate filaments. Um, our process is thermal draw. It makes accurate filaments through um, essentially thermodynamics, right? So we we balance surface tension forces and inertial forces. And that's what makes things accurate. I mean, that and, and the know-how required to design the preform. So, you know, you can kind of get a mess if, you, if your preform is very asymmetric. You know, maybe you have all your metals kind of on one side and, and all your polymer on the other side, but then you might not get a very precise filament. You might get some variation in that. But if it's reasonably symmetric, and, and by the way, we can do square cross sections and rectangular cross sections, elliptical, anything we want, as long as we, we understand how the surface tension forces and the inertial forces balance. So we can retain that aspect ratio. But there are some design rules around kind of what you put where to make sure that it does draw down nicely and uniformly. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's the force balance that determines that. And it's, it's quite, you know, it's quite reproducible. All right, thank you so much. Okay, um, so let me go on then and I will talk about this, uh, this one undersea sensing application a little bit more. Okay, so um, using that concept of the, the advanced system and fiber platform, um, we developed what we affectionately call LAMP POST, which is this acronym that I'll let you, let you read there. And it's a lightweight sensing system to monitor the ocean. It's, it's basically one fiber, and uh, where a fiber is used loosely, as I said, this is more like a, more like lawn chair webbing than, than a fiber, but it's a single filament. Um, you can roll it up pretty small, which is why the US Navy was very interested in that, because they often like to deploy sensors from airplanes, particularly nav air, and uh, the smaller the sensor system is, the more stuff they can pack in and deploy, so this is very interesting to them. So this platform is obviously easy to deploy. It's tailorable with up to hundreds of sensors. Um, you can, if you have a fiber just kind of dangling, a you know, really long one, you know, multiple kilometers long, perhaps even, um, you can get continuous data along that entire length for as long as that fiber lasts. You know, could be hours, could be months, could even eventually be years. And if the one at the top has an antenna and it has other microelectronics to, um, to send data someplace, 
Well, you can get quasi real time data visualization and analysis. And this has very broad interest, you know, much broader than the Navy who, who sort of, you know, got excited about this first. It's of interest for people studying climate change, for studying uh, the health of fisheries, uh, the health of you know, oyster beds and what have you. So for example, the state of Rhode Island, um, of course, there's Narragansett Bay, there's a big bay in Rhode Island. Um, the state of Rhode Island is outfitting Narragansett Bay with a broad range of sensors. Uh, and they want those sensors to sit there over time. And they want to be the ones, the first ones in the nation, to truly understand the effect of climate change over, over many years on the bay and on the, the, the life inside the bay and the temperature and the salinity and water clarity and everything else. So they're very interested in this platform for that reason, for climate change monitoring. So if you, if you ever, if you want to Google the Smart Bay project, you can, uh, you can find out more about what the, what the state of Rhode Island is up to. So what are we competing against? So probably the most sophisticated, not probably, definitely the most sophisticated competing capability comes from the Argo program. Uh, so here's a website, you can check it out later. Um, the Argo program is a, it's a very large collaboration among 30 different countries that um, are busy working together, um, you know, funded by over 50 different funding agencies. They're making a global array of buoys to monitor the ocean. And this is just a screenshot, but if you go to the website, you can actually click on each one of these and, and figure out, you know, each, each one of these dots is a place where an Argo float has come to the surface and measured the temperature of the ocean. So that is a, that is a pretty impressive capability, um, unless you look a little bit more closely. So here's how an Argo float works, and there's a few different flavors of them. Some of them go more deeply than others and have different sensing capability. But basically, one of these Argo floats is deployed. It spends about six to 12 hours at the surface, and then it slowly sinks You know, over about six hours. It might go down 1,000 meters. Again, the deep Argo will go much deeper. They'll go 4,000 to 6,000 meters. They drift around. They're not controlled in any way. They just drift with the currents, and you know, maybe a shark bumps into it or something. It just drifts around for about nine days. Sometimes it goes deeper. And then it starts to come up slowly. And um, it measures, most of them measure salinity and temperature. Again, there are a few that measure some other things. They come up slowly, and then they pop back up again after about a total of 10 days of, of, of doing this cycle. And they send their data someplace. So um, they do this maybe 100 times. You know, sometimes, if, depending on what you're measuring, it can even do it a few hundred times, depending on the flavor of the Argo float. But after that, it, it has a primary battery. So after it dies, it just sinks to the ocean and stays there as trash, which nobody loves. Also, um, if you're, let's say you're the Navy, or you have some other reason for knowing some data in the ocean in a particular location at a particular time, the Argo program is not likely to help you because the, although there are a lot of these, there are a lot of these dots, you know, that was integrated over time. It's like any place an Argo float has ever popped up. But the odds of actually having an Argo float at the time you need it is like, is minuscule. So instead, the Navy also has these other technologies. They have an XBT, which is an expendable bathothermograph, which, which they throw off the side of a ship. It gives them a single profile in time and space of temperature versus depth. And you might wonder why they care so much about temperature, where it turns out that you know, they care about sonar a lot, like they, they, they use sonar significantly. And um, the speed of sound in water is a function of temperature. So that's why they care a lot about temperature. Uh, and they care about it, like where they are, where they're looking at that moment. You know, Argo doesn't help them. And as it turns out, an XBT or an EcoPuck um, apparently, it takes about six hours to deploy it and get the data back and analyze the data, which is also not particularly real time. So we have a way of getting all these people real time data in a persistent fashion with a known location. And again, you know, we could deploy a lot of these. As, as, it'll take a long time to beat the Argo, but there's a lot of reasons why this technology is interesting to people who don't have any other options besides the ones in this table. Uh, Livia? 
Yes. Can, can I just um, in, interrupt? There's um, a couple questions about uh, about sort of the environmental impact. Uh, Logan, uh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering what the ecological effects of the um, these novel fibers that you're developing might be if they're like deployed in the ocean like this. Yeah. Well, I mean, the short answer is we don't we don't know yet, but I can tell you that it's a whole lot more benign than a whole bunch of giant floats that end up sinking to the bottom. I mean, we we hate that. You know, these these we can we can roll back up and take out because they're never going to sink. They're just they're going to be on the ocean surface, so we can we can retrieve them. In fact, the next thing I, I'm going to tell you about a a little bit of testing that that we've done where we where indeed we we retrieve the fiber in each case. Any other questions? Um, I think you there were, but I think you kind of answered answered them. So okay, um, yep. Okay, so uh, so I'll go on and tell you about uh, some of our testing. And of course, you know, here here we are. We're competing against this behemoth Argo program. Um, so why would they take our word for it that this is better? So of course, we started to embark on some testing. You know, roughly a year ago. This is a pretty new program. Um, so the first thing we did was we just had a beaker. We had about 10, meter, 10 meters of this fiber with, uh, with some temperature sensors and accelerometers. And I tell you about, I'll tell you about the accelerometers in a couple slides, why we had those. Um, but we recorded the data. This was just in fresh water for over 24 hours. So that was a good start. Um, so then we went to the pool. We have, a, we have a pool here at Lincoln that we can use for testing. This is also fresh water. This was now a five meter fiber and we hung a bunch of weights off it to make sure that it would survive if it were really long and it, were in the, it was in the ocean and there were lots of forces on it. And so that did pretty well. So we have a couple of technical staff here uh, during COVID, you can see they're, they're masked and they're working on this, uh, on this uh, fiber, fiber spool that they're unspooling. So then we moved to the ocean. Um, so the first ocean test, uh, they had a, it was an interesting story. So here they have 10 meters of fiber. They're looking pretty happy here. This is when they first showed up. It had five nodes and they were trying to get a full day of data. They wanted to get eight hours of data. Notice they only got one and a half hours. So these guys showed up on the pier. They had the pier rented. They worked with a, with a person from the Navy who, um, you know, who was the go-between with the Coast Guard. This was a Coast Guard pier. So they showed up in the morning, they set up all their stuff, um, you know, their, all their instrumentation, they put the fiber, to, fiber over the ocean. They hung around for about an hour. Everything seemed to be going great. So they're like, all right, you know, let's, let's go have some breakfast. So they left and they came back a few hours later to check on things. And all of their equipment was piled in a corner. The fiber had been cut with a knife or scissors, jumbled into a ball and thrown in the trash. So first their heads exploded. Then, then after they calmed down, they, uh, they fished their fiber, their cut fiber out of the trash. You know, they retrieved all their equipment. They talked to the harbor master, you know, oh my God, huge misunderstanding, blah, blah, blah. Um, brought all the stuff back to Lincoln. And lo and behold, while it was taking, the, the, everything still works. Like they were actually able to, to reconnect it and pull the data off of it. And this, this incredibly maddening thing was, you can tell by the fact that they, they only got an hour and a half that somebody came and destroyed their setup only a half hour after they left because they hung around for an hour. But on the other hand, this was a, an unplanned stress test of this platform. So it was pretty robust to be able to survive the cutting and balling up and throwing in the trash. So they didn't quite learn what they wanted to learn, but they learned something important. So next, okay, it was like, all right, they're, they're elusive eight hours of data. They, they uh, went on a ship off the coast of Gloucester, again, you know, planned out all with the captain of this, this vessel, um, went out in, in, in open water to test 100 meters of fiber. And, um, you know, they, they worked with the captain to find a location where the sea was at least 100 meters deep to get their data. So they're out there and uh, you know, they're out there for, uh, for about three hours and then a storm comes in. And so the captain's like, we gotta go back. There's no way we can stay out here. It's way too dangerous. 
Um, so here again, they're still all smiling and the sky is blue. This is early, early in their, in their three hour tour for those of you who know Gilligan's Island. Um, but then the captain told them that, you know, sorry, we have to go. And so they were about to roll up their fiber and because it had been very windy and the, the boat had been buffeted quite a bit, they somehow ended up in a location where the, the ocean was not deep enough. And they inadvertently turned their fiber sensor system into an anchor. So there was a little bit of panic going on. They were trying to get it loose. And the captain said, you guys have 10 minutes. And if you don't get it, then I'm cutting it. And we have to leave it and we're going. And so of course, after what they had, what happened on pier side, they really, really didn't want that to happen. So they worked really hard. They finally got the thing undone, yanking on it, pulling on it, going in different directions. And finally got it, rolled it back up, came back. Again, kind of an inadvertent stress test, but they got data. So very, very exciting. Um, you know, this thing is surviving uh, a lot of a lot of difficult conditions. And then finally, perhaps the most exciting is um, they got a chance to send the fiber um, to the Arctic as part of the ice ex exercise that the Navy was doing. And they finally got their eight hours of continuous data under the hardest possible conditions under sea ice in the Arctic. And they were able to come back and take the data and get good results. So we're super excited by this. We're super excited to work with partners on the next steps of maturing this technology and this capability. Um, so I said I would get back to the accelerometer. Uh, so why do we put an accelerometer in there? Well, typically in these uh, sensor systems, you know, you need to know depth, right? And generally um, the way it's done is, is um, they measure pressure to, and correlate that with depth. The trouble is that pressure sensors are big and, and you can't really make them smaller without a lot of work. However, accelerometers are really, really tiny. And if you're clever, if you know the position of the top node, which you're always going to because floating on the surface, you know how long it is and you know the position of the individual sensor nodes. So you know the location of the accelerometers. You can fit, um, and you, know, you can take the accelerometer data, and fit that data to a catenary model. And you can, from that, you can back out the depth of each node. And so you can see here, uh, we compared the accelerometer data to pressure data. Also here, uh, pressure data and accelerometer data uh, along the length of the fiber. And you can see the currents in the ocean kind of made the, made the fiber sort of you know, go to the side. And we had, uh, we had large you know, macro scale pressure sensors alongside to take truth data. And the agreement was really, really good. So we have an invention disclosure filed on this. This was a COVID idea. One of our uh, one of our colleagues uh, figured this out. He hung some fiber on the back of his closet door, and he was sort of flapping it around. He did some calculations. He's like, "Yeah, I think this is going to work." So anyway, cool idea when you have some design constraints that uh, that you didn't have before. Hey, Olivia, um, there's there's a question. Uh, Tamer Haddad, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, since the fibers um, are in the deep sea, or are in really like strong ocean currents. How does the um, ocean currents like moving the fibers um, affect the data? Since you're trying to get um, information in specific locations underwater. Yeah, so that's exactly how we use the accelerometer data. So we correlate um, the data from each sensor node to both um, to X, Y, and Z position. So that allows us afterwards to map out that part of the ocean. You know, so that so that's that's exactly the point. Like that's that's exactly what we're trying to do is, is to understand that you know whatever property they're trying to measure to understand it in three dimensions. Cool. And uh, Evan Evan Co, do you want to ask uh, ask your question? Uh, yeah. So I was wondering, is there a significant um, I guess benefit to using a wire like this where the chips are like the sensors are embedded in the wire compared to having uh, maybe a slightly larger sensor on a length of rope? Yeah, so because it, it allows, um, again, it, it depends on your deployment mechanism. So if you have as much space as you want and, and, and as much weight allocation as you want, then there's really no advantage. But if you're volume constrained or space constrained, for example, like the Navy who wants to deploy these from, um, from airplanes, you know, from essentially their little 
their little buoy deploy, you know, little shoots that they deploy things out of, you can't fit the larger sensor array in there. Um, and then even, you know, even the University of Rhode Island folks, even the Narragansett Bay people. So in their case, they want to have a lot of different kinds of sensors and, and, and platforms. So if the, sen if the systems are big, then they kind of run out of room. You know, like the, the more, the, 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 the smaller the sensors are, the more kinds of sensing that they can do. So it's, it's, it's a lot like, you know, it's a lot like your smartwatch or your smartphone that, that, that having things be small has its own value proposition. And there's a lot of ways that that can be beneficial. You know, put it up into space, weight matters a lot, right? So there's all sorts of reasons. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, shall I go on? Okay, so uh, we're getting sort of close to the end here. Um, and so at this point, you know, I, I invite our audience to think about what we could do next. You know, what are the kinds of things that we could do with this platform? Besides the things that I mentioned here, and of course the things I didn't mention here, which you don't know about, um, but let's look at let's look at some possibilities of, of you know what might be possible. So let's look at medical systems today. Okay, these are primarily worn to sustain life, or in some cases to do medical research. They are invariably bulky and uncomfortable, and even embarrassing to wear. Like if you're doing a sleep study or I don't know what, you know, you're trying to do some kind of brain imaging, you know, this is actually a, a more compact version of what people are usually stuck wearing. So you would really not want to walk around in your life wearing something like that. So imagine if these could be true textiles. Imagine if a type one diabetic could wear something that were as comfortable and as unobtrusive as a textile that would allow them to you know, regulate their insulin level versus what they have to do today. Or you know, imagine if you, somebody didn't have to prick their finger five times a day for decades. You know, this real, real potential for, for real quality of life benefit. Um, OK, let's look at sports performance gear. Right, so we all have our smart watches, and that's great. Um, but we know they're actually pretty inaccurate. Um, you know, you, pro you probably realize that that the you know SpO2 measurement is pretty inaccurate. The sleep measurement is pretty inaccurate. Um, so there are a lot of times, or people, particularly if they're professional athletes, that they want better data. But this particular one. Um, for example, uh, you, you actually have to wear compression gear to maintain sensor contact with the body. You know, and some of these, this, these physiological um, sensors, you know, they're okay if they're on your wrist, but it's better if they're on your torso or it's better if they're near your head. And so wherever it is, you know, that's where they put it. And it, they require a rigid transmitter and that's gonna be some kind of puck again. And for sure, it's not going to be machine washable. And for sure, it's going to be expensive to get back to some of the maybe the first couple questions we got in the seminar today. And to quote Dawson Cagle, who's a program manager at IARPA, who we're working with, no one wants a $200 shirt that you can't wash. So bottom line, there is really no killer app yet to replace the smartwatch. So, you know, you've got these other wearables, there's, there's Google Glass. Well, that looks pretty strange. That didn't really take off. Um, you have these physiological status monitors. They're uncomfortable. Um, you have these things that I never heard of until seeing this presentation from IARPA. And I wondered why you would even want a jean jacket that did the same thing that your, your smartwatch does. And of course, you've got the smartwatch and you've got the smartphone. And these are currently the consumer electronics of choice because these textile systems still have a lot of problems and a lot of challenges. In a, and, and I think you know, that's the reason why there's really no killer app because there's still these compromises. So what are those compromises? What are those technology gaps? Well, one of the biggest ones, one of my biggest pet peeves working in this space is that the electronic components are too large. They could be smaller. They could easily be smaller. It's, it's a matter of time and money. 
And, you know, so if, if there were a company with deep pockets that got into this space, this problem would disappear. You know, these, these electronic components could get smaller. Um, the elephant in the room that somebody already uh, correctly identified, the battery. Now, unlike the first bullet, there really isn't a battery yet that eliminates the puck and the plug. People are working on it. We're working on it. Uh, we're not there yet. I think we're going to get there. Somebody's going to get there. Um, but it's still a work in progress. Now, the level of complexity, right? We would love to have electronics of the same level of complexity that we can get on circuit boards and we can get on silicon wafers. So for that to be true, we need very, very thin ribbon-shaped multi-layer interposers that enable essentially, you know, long skinny circuitry compatible with, with the size, shape, and material properties of threads. This is also something that could be done today if anybody were interested to do it. So for example, NextFlex is an organization that makes flexible electronics. Um, their business model is printed electronics. Unfortunately, the feature sizes of printed electronics make this impossible. You know, we need processes that create smaller feature sizes. We need somebody to get interested in that research problem. We need interconnects that you can cut and sew. So we are really good at working around this problem, but we haven't solved it. We essentially, we put things together and we attach things, but there is a fair amount of manual processing because we don't have, we can't just make hundreds of meters of a sensor fiber, cut it wherever we want and sew it into something. So maybe one idea is maybe those interconnects will be liquid metal. Maybe you guys have other ideas. I would love to hear them if you do. Um, I already said this before in answer to a question, but since we don't quite have the battery, we can attack the problem from the other direction and make electronic subthreshold electronics that use nanoamps of power and have ultra low power sensing. Machine washability also came up. Right? We don't want the $200 shirt that we can't wash. This isn't that difficult a problem. I think it's a question of having really good encapsulants. So another research problem, unsolved, but, but you know, probably not impossible. You know, no, no physics says this can't be done. And ultimately, you know, the moonshot is we want to replace all rigid components, all electronics, all chips with flexible stretchable ones. So that's really a research problem that somebody could tackle. So who is tackling that? Um, there is a new program. Um, you might be familiar with IARPA. You might be familiar with DARPA. These are funding agencies, the Defense um, Advanced Research Programs or agency, or I forget what the exact acronym is. But anyway, the I stands for intelligence. And they're very similar organizations. They are starting, they just started a program to fill some of these gaps. And the name of the program, appropriately enough, is Smarty Pants. Smart electrically powered and networked textile systems. And we're working closely with IARPA and we're really excited to see what proposers, maybe some of your, um, if any of you work for, um, you know, work in undergraduate research, um, you know, maybe some of you already know about this program or will have an opportunity work to work on something like this in the future. A lot of those problems, a lot of those technology gaps that I described, I'm really excited to say will probably be solved in the next few years by this program. So how would you use active smart textiles? And what is stopping you? What would stop you? Here are a few ideas for you to think about. And so with that, I will end and uh, open up the floor once again for questions and comments. All right, thank you so much, Olivia. That was awesome. And um, we we are running low on time because, uh, because we uh, interrupted you with so many fantastic questions along the way. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just seeing if um, maybe there's uh, you know, one more quick question. Um, let, let's see, Eleanor, do you want to just ask uh, your question? Oh, and um, if, Olivia, if you can stop uh, the screen share yeah, now, sure. that way um, can get a look of everyone. Okay. Um, so, Eleanor, do you want to just ask your question as a last one, and then after that, we'll we'll um, wrap up with the presentation. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, I'm just going to 
Sure. Uh, yeah, going back to the batteries, I was just wondering if anybody was working on like batteries that are rechargeable via thermal energy, like for the wearables. Um, I don't think I've seen that yet. I, I, I hesitate to say nobody's working on it because there are really a lot of people working on batteries, but I have to say I haven't seen thermally rechargeable batteries yet in this form factor. Thank you. All right, um, let's see. So, so we have a, um, a short presentation, uh, Dhatri Parakal and Sah Sahil Mehta um, from the Remote Sensing for Disaster Response uh, group. Do, you, do the two of you wanna uh, come up now? Yeah, so hi, I really like this presentation. I'm like personally into like just anything engineering related, so like robotics, I'm big on like robotics and CS, but I also have like a pretty big background in like electronics engineering and like my parents did electronics engineering. So I really liked learning and hearing more about like wearable technologies and just basically like integrating circuitry in threading. And so it was really interesting for me to listen to. Well, great. Well, we, we do hire summer interns. So if you're, keep, keep in touch with us. <laughs> Um, Dan, there was also a question in the chat about um, how they can contact us. So I don't know if you, I'm happy to have them contact me directly, or if you prefer, have them go through you guys at Beaverworks. How would you, how would you like to do that? Oh, I think, um, you know, uh, if you, if you want to share your contact information, feel free to do that. If, uh, if, if you would prefer to do that, uh, yeah. you know, we, through Beaverworks, we can, we can do it that way too. So yeah. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I see Bob Shin yeah. just, just shared the Beaverworks email address and I just put my email okay. address in the Great. chat. So Great. And then uh, Sahil? Yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, I do uh, engineering. I have, uh, I'm in an internship for remote sensing. My parents have done engineering for a long time. They're both software engineers too. So I've grown up uh, with the background in engineering for a really long time. And I just think that the work you guys are doing are really cool. Thank you. We're pretty excited about it too. Oh, also, uh, you're going to be getting a t-shirt. Cool. Thank you. From BWSI. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. Um, thank, thank you, Dotri and Sahil and, and Livia again. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think you probably captured a, a lot of people's imagination with this, um, you know, com really completely new, uh, <laughs> you know, approach toward toward doing uh, microelectronics and thinking, you know, thinking about all the different possible directions that this can go. So, um, you know, thank you so much. Um, I think um, if everyone else can just stick on for another minute to, um, while we see if there are any announcements. And um, uh, Livia, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, only a few announcements today. Um, just make sure you're paying attention to the dashboard. We do have some things due on Monday. So make sure um, you guys can try to get those done over the weekend. And then um, there's no seminar tomorrow. So all your instructors are aware of that. So make sure you ask them in class today. Um, what's going on for this hour tomorrow, just so you guys are all, in a, all aware. And that's it. So we'll see you guys all on Monday. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.